The following program is the first audience presentation given by Dr. Peter Hoynowski. Fatima Fraud, Our Case for an Imposter Lucy. Part 1. Look for Part 2, coming soon. First of all, you're going to have to submit to a little experiment. So, you're just going to look at some pictures because all the... We consulted so many, dozens and dozens of scientific experts, investigative experts, and many, many say that the human eye is a better judge of things than the most advanced computers. And I think you'll see why that is true, even though we're gonna bring forward the math to show you that this fraud has been perpetrated on us. But we're just gonna have a little experiment, okay? I want you to really look. Look at the faces being presented. Look at the mouth. Look at the chin. Look at the eyebrows. Look at the phylum. You know what the phylum is? The phylum is it's the little part between the nose and the lips. Uh, everything matters in this regard. So look at all the aspects of the faces that I present to you, and then I want you to react. When there's something wrong, I want you to raise your hand, okay? Here's page 10. The famous picture of the three children of Fatima. About the age of 13. As you can see, a very strong figure, a very strong face, a face that has already known adversity. There's a certain aura about it. When entering the Dorothean nuns, This is moving, isn't it? Member of the Dorothean Order. One of the few profiles that we have of Sister Lucy, she's a Dorothean nun, and you can see her profile. Notice the chin, the lips, the forehead. Sister Lucy, again, a very famous picture as a Dorothean. Wait, what? No way. Wait a minute. I meant I spent all that money on something that's obvious. Wait. <laughs> Check it out again. Uh, this one's 1967. Is she? We we have no pictures of her from the early 50s until. This is 1967, May 13th, when she met with Paul VI at Fatima. Okay? Now go back. This is, now I'm going to give you the dates. This is 1947. 
Dorothea. And this is 1967 Carmelite. Just my own, my own interest. Are we dealing with the same person who says yes? Who says no? no. Fatima Fraud, Our Case for an Imposter Lucy. Part 2. Okay. So it was based on that problem, the apparent difference between these pictures and between what seems like two different women that caused us to begin this investigation. And what, I, what we've done is put the case, we, we're going to prove fraud here. And what we've done is put all the evidence in three separate categories. One is the historical, one is the photographic. So if a fraud of this magnitude occurred, then clear inconsistencies, anomalies, and perhaps even a warning from heaven should exist. You think there's going to be a warning from heaven? There is. There is. Photographic, Sister Lucy Truth, the organization we have, accumulated over 100 photographs of Sister Lucia from 1917 to 2005 and submitted them to unbiased experts of various specialties, really those who are on the top of their professions. Because we wanted the best, and we wanted a, because it was so serious, we wanted an objective analysis. Then, for a looking at another scale of value and looking for another indicator, we had a handwriting analyst. Sister Lucy Truth obtained hundreds of pages of authentic writing from the real Sister Lucia. One of those was an extremely rare and high quality copy of the third secret of Fatima published by the Vatican. Four writing specimens dated post-1967 and a total of 20 authentic signatures prior to 1967 and two question signatures post-1967. These specimens were examined over the course of six months. It took a long time to get this in. Okay, so what I'm doing for you today is I'm presenting to you the evidence as we have it now we have never put forward this much evidence before to any audience or on the internet. So here we go. First, we're going to look at the historical element of this, this situation. What do we say? Why do we care? Why do we care about the identity of this, this woman, Sister Lucy of Fatima. I know I don't have to say that to you, but objectively speaking, why do we need to care? The identity of Sister Lucy is tied up with the history of the Fatima apparitions. The largest public miracle in human history, the miracle of the sun, subsequent to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The events culminating in 1960 and thereafter demand a reasonable explanation and renewed examination. 
Now look at this. I'm, you will appreciate this because it's amazing what we found. It seems to be the case that, that the transition from the real Sister Lucia to the, sister, to the new Sister Lucia, quote unquote, how many things in our age have to be quote unquote, exactly parallels the transition from the traditional Catholic faith to the new faith of post-Vatican II. Okay, I mentioned to you about a warning from heaven. And I just found this last week in a, in a text called Fatima and Twilight. It mentions the fact that on her deathbed, so remember Jacinta, Francisco had already died in 1919 from the Spanish flu. Now Jacinta is going to come down with it. And she is going to die the next year, 1920. Before she dies, she has a message. Our Lady appears to her when she is on her deathbed. And she con and conveys to Jacinta a message. Jacinta is going to convey that message to Lucia. The message was a warning of the grave dangers that threatened Lucy, both at that time and in the future. The priest who was in charge of the area of Fatima, he heard this from Jacinta. He immediately tried to get both seers out of Fatima. Of course, Jacinta was ill. He took uh, Lucia to Lisbon to protect her life. He was going to put her in a school in Lisbon. He was going to have her have a new identity, a new name. And she was never to speak about Fatima. Well, the government of Portugal the Masonic government of Portugal found out where Lucia was. So they had to take her again and go back to Fatima. But she was always under threat. In 1921, she goes to, they bring her to a Dorothean school in Porto, Portugal, run by the, Dor the sisters of St. Dorothy. And she was instructed, she was given a new name, Maria das Doris, Mary of Sorrows. And they, they forbade her at the school from ever talking about Fatima. In fact, later, she's going to join herself, the Dorothean sisters. And during that whole time, only once was she given permission to speak about Fatima when they were doing an official study of the apparition. So otherwise she was to maintain silence. So much happened to her as a Dorothean. I focus for, the mo for one moment on the apparition that she received at Tui, Spain when the Holy Trinity appeared to her, she was shown the graces and efficacy of the Mass. And she was also shown Our Lady who held her Immaculate Heart in her hand at the foot of the cross. It was during this apparition that Our Lady came as she promised on July 13th, 1917, our Lady came to her and asked for the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart. So, so many things happened to Sister Lucy Dos Santos of Fatima 
when she was a Dorothean nun, and you see her habit there. Okay, Lucia does return to Fatima in 1946, and within a few months, she indicates her long-held desire to become a Carmelite. She's going to leave the Dorothean order after over 20 years, and she's going to need permission to go to the Carmelites. Well, strangely enough, that's just the facts. The request is approved by the intervention of Monsignor Giovanni Battista Montini. He signs off on the papers for this, for this transfer. She would go to the Carmel at Coimbra in Portugal. Of course, during this time, there was all talk about this third secret coming out before 1960. Everyone was talking about the Cardinal from Portugal, uh, Cardinal Ottaviani. Everyone was looking to that date, 1960. Now, look at this date. December 26, 1957. In this, you have what I believe is the last interview with the real Sister Lucy. It's an interview given to Father Fuentes, who is there as postulator for the cause of the beatification of Jacinta and Francisco. All right? Then look at that. After this interview, Sister Lucy was not allowed to be interviewed anymore for the next several decades. The interview was not published, so she gave the interview, he left, and he went back to Mexico. He was Mexican. The interview was not published until May 1958. But then he gave a conference. Father Fuentes gave a conference in 1958. And first of all, he described the Sister Lucy that he met the, uh, a few months before. Look what he says. He said, describe Sister Lucy's appearance as very sad, pale, and drawn. Now this is, so that's the way she appeared to she appeared. She told, what did she tell Father Fuentes? She told him the chastisement from heaven is imminent. This is December 26, 1957. The chastisement from heaven is imminent. The year 1960 is on us. And then what will happen? It will be very sad for everyone and far from a happy thing if the world does not pray and do penance before then. All right, that sounds, who thinks that sounds like Sister Lucy? Seems like it sounds like Sister Lucy, the one that we know. So it sounds like Sister Lucy. He's, uh, he has a reason to be there. It sounds like Sister Lucy, seems like Sister Lucy, but then seems like strange things go on. The interview's published in 1958. Then, in 1959, the Diocese of Coimbra, on July 2nd, 1959, released a disconcerting note publicly disavowing Father Fuentes, along with the following words of correction, supposedly coming from Sister Lucy about Father Fuentes. This is what she's supposed to say. I know nothing and could therefore say nothing about such punishments, which are falsely attributed to me. This note, issued by the diocese, 
ends with the following line. The note closes with these words. Sister Lucy has nothing more to say on Fatima. What happened? Well, why, all, why is it getting strange all of a sudden? It's 1959. Why is it all getting so strange? Here are the events that happened 1958 to 1959 and then into the 60s. I'm just going to run through them because I think they matter. This is a transitional year. So, and what happens in the church is going to affect Sister Lucy and what happens to her, surely. Number one, October 9th, 1958, Pope Pius XII dies. On October 26th, 1958, in the conclave, on that day there were two releases of smoke. In the first release, when they're burning the ballots after two ballots, there was at the conclave, of course, uh, white smoke initially went up the pipe, but then black smoke gushed out. Then, in the evening, the second burning of the ballots on this day, white smoke emerges for, and it enlivens the crowd and it, and it indicates to the Vatican radio and the announcers that a pope has been chosen. For five minutes, smoke, white smoke went up the chimney at this, from the Sistine Chapel. Well, as we know, nobody came out on the balcony that day. They're supposed to come out after 20 minutes. Nobody comes out. What happens? Then, later in the evening, they announced there was a mistake. October 27, 1958, a penumbral lunar eclipse appeared over Rome from 5.13 p.m. to 6.36. If you think back to Our Lady of La Salette, the church will be in eclipse Maybe it's just odd. Then, on October 28, 1958, Angelo Roncalli appears on the balcony as John the 23rd. This concerns us, this critical move, and we're going to follow up on it because we want to know what happened in that conclave of 1958. We want to know. And who would know? Who would be spying on that conclave? The U.S. government. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. So we want to get the declassified documents concerning that conclave. What happened? Because clearly, it was the turning point for Sister Lucy, as we will see We at Sister Lucy Truth are fighting to finish the investigation. If you are able, and want to see justice for Sister Lucia, please consider sending any size donation to keep us going. Thank you.
want to get the declassified documents concerning that conclave? What happened? Because clearly it was the turning point for Sister Lucy, as we will see. Look at that date. Doesn't it give you chills? October 11th, 1958. We got two declassified documents from the State Department already. And they tell us, look at it's dated, October 11, 2 p.m., uh, 1958. It's from the American ambassador to Italy to the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. And it says, so this is a confidential, extremely secret communique, uh, communication. It says this. This is before, October 11th, so this is right after Pius XII dies. During conversation with embassy officer, Vatican source expressed personal view. Next Pope will be elected outside conclave by agreement between cardinals. So, a little interesting. Then, gets really interesting. Zellerbach is the American ambassador to Italy at the time, a Jewish man. He says this, just fill in Cardinal at the beginning, Cardinal Siri, Ruffini, Ottaviani would be misfortune for church since these three cardinals have an unrealistic approach to great problems facing the world today. Source said election of any one of these three could depend on the influence of American cardinals and volunteered suggestion U.S. authorities would do well to exercise discreetly their own influence on certain American cardinals. They want to get their hands in there. Because, who are these guys? These are the, these are the traditionalists, electors. Siri, Ruffini, Ottaviani. Now John XXIII is elected, and this is, we, we, don't, we don't know much yet. This is another declassified document that we've received. And it says, just look at number two. I have noted with some humor that... This is after John the 23rd is elected and the ambassador's writing to the Secretary of State. I have noted with some humor that the new Pope is captioned in the various magazine articles about papal candidates as non-political. I have never met a more politically aware individual. While more than 10 years of service as a papal legate and nuncio seemed to me rather political. So he's talking about John the 23rd. And then John the 23rd's elected, and look what happens. Think about what's happening to Sister Lucy. Already her message is getting changed. January 25th, 1959. John XXIII calls for the Second Vatican Council as one of his first acts. February 1960, the Portuguese news agency in Rome released a statement. And I know my mother told me about this, you know, right? You remember, okay. Uh, the Portuguese news in Rome released a statement received anonymously from Vatican sources saying, it is most probable that the secret of Fatima will remain forever under absolute seal. Remember, the secret was supposed to be revealed by 1960. And you ask yourself this, would Sister Lucy, if she had this mandate from Our Lady, would she allow this? October 11th, look at that day. 
October 11th, 1962, 57 years ago to the day. Today, John the 23rd opens the Second Vatican Council and makes his infinite remarks denouncing the prophets of doom. Who are the prophets of doom? Our Lady of Fatima, Sister Lucy. Uh, look at another date, connecting Vatican II to Fatima and the miracle of the sun. October 13th, 1962, marked the first initial working session of the council. We're in members of the top 10 concil conciliar commissions were elected. So it all, Vatican II actually begins on October 13th, 1962. Okay, let's summarize what we've come to, historically speaking. Sister Lucy, not publicly seen again. Okay, so that was 1957, she gave that interview. Sister Lucy was not publicly seen again until May 13th, 1967, on the 50th anniversary of Fatima with Paul VI. Strikingly, in her 1967 appearance before the world, Sister Lucy, look at quotes, now we're gonna put in the little quotes. Sister Lucy appeared jovial, and in good health, even gesturing to the crowd, cheering crowd, as if prodding them for more adulation. <laughs> you wait and see the picture. So that happens 1967. Look what happens 1968. All these years, one after another. Paul VI changed the right of uh, consecration and ordination, promulgates the new mass, now look at this, we have this letter, we have this letter, we've analyzed this letter, December 27th, 1969. Sister Lucy writes a strongly worded letter demanding complete obedience to Paul VI. Take a, well, you think that's gonna be authentic, huh? This is her raising the roof motion of, you know, cheerleading, getting the crowd all riled up for Paul VI. Give me a break. Can you, well, I can't go back to the other one. Can you imagine? Then, the strange interview in 1992 and 1993. Just one thing about this interview, both interviews were on October 11th. October 11th, 1992, and October 11th, 1993. It was with Carlos Evaristo. And it's videotaped. You can see it on the internet. You can see it on YouTube. What do you think she's gonna say? Punishment is imminent. Do penance. Russia uh, should be converted. Wrong. This is what she said in that interview. You can see her work saying it on tape. It was taped. The third secret, this is her. The third secret was not supposed to be revealed in 1960. The secret was meant only for the Pope and not the public. Russia did not need to be mentioned by name in the consecration. Heaven has accepted John Paul II's 1984 consecration. The Jews continue to be a chosen people of God. The triumph of the Immaculate Heart has already taken place. But it's an ongoing process, so it just doesn't seem like it. Okay, go. <laughs> After you get off the hill, you pretty much see it's very ongoing, yeah. Um, but I, 
it's on YouTube, you have to see it. She's at the, this mass for the beatification of Jacinta and Francisca. And this is her receiving communion from John Paul II, 2000. As soon as, first of all, she goes up, she goes up when he's giving her the host, he, she goes up to grab his hand, almost like she's used to receiving communion in the hand. And he has to sort of insert it in her mouth strongly. And then immediately after she gets communion, she starts kissing the hand of John Paul II. And then she asked her bodyguard if she could stay next to John Paul II on the altar while he was giving out communion. For the woman who received the blessed sacrament from an angel, who prostrated himself on the ground, in the same year, she had an interview with John Paul II that was taped. She held his hand for two hours during that interview. Summary of historical evidence. Warning from Our Lady that Lucia's life was in danger and would be in the future. A cascade of events bringing the late 1950s and the early 60s into sharp focus. Multiple sources announcing the third secret to be released in 1960. Powerful 1957 interview with Father Fuentes and which was denied thereafter by the Diocese of Coimbra. Direct connection between Fatima and the first working session of Vatican II, and multiple inconsistencies in Sister Lucia's behavior and statements post-1967. Now, photographic evidence. Here we go. What we did, we have over 100 pictures of Sister Lucy from one time or another. We divided them up into four categories. The A category, which is Sister Lucy as a child. The B category, which is Sister Lucy in the 1920s, 1940s, early 50s. Excuse me, that's the B category. The C category is Sister Lucy on that one day, May 13th, in 1967, when she was in Fatima. So that's sub subject C. Then subject D is post-1981, when John Paul II went to see her. All right, those pictures after 1981. Who did we consult? We consulted two board-certified plastic surgeons. We consulted periodontists. We consulted with uh, a criminal forensic sketch artist, and I'll talk about her in a moment. And then we have an ophthalmologist. That information is the, released here for the first time. Okay, so what's the, what's the evidence? Expert analysis of photographs. First one, the plastic surgeon, Dr. Julio Garcia, board certified in plastic surgery by the American Board of Plastic Surgeons, a member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery, a member of the American Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, chief of plastic surgery, at both Humana Sunrise and Valley Hospitals. He also has an art degree from Northwestern University, and he's on the American Board of Anti-Aging. I wonder what that is. <laughs> okay, we bring you his conclusion. First, 
He saw all the pictures, and he pointed out things to us that we didn't even see, and we had to follow up on. He says this. He never heard of this case before. He ne- we, he's just looking at the evidence. I am of the opinion that subject B, 1940s, Sister Lucy, and subject C, 1967, Sister Lucy, share some similarities, but I am very confident they are not the same individual. Finding number one, inconsistent chin. Now I think you can see the chins, right? Same person, same person. Come over here, sit over here. (laughs) You gotta see these chins. Every single specialist got the chin, the chin, the chin, the chin. And nobody thinks for some reason that Sister Lucy had a chin implant. Nobody. All right? It seems a lot. Yeah. Finding inconsistent chins, visibly different chins, unexplainable except the individuals are different, or a chin implant. (laughs) Subject C and D, that's 1967 and after, okay? Subject C and D have far more prominent protrusive chins when compared to the profile view of subject B on top, the real Sister Lucy. The difference cannot be explained by the aging process, nor can dental work account for the observed discrepancy. As we age, we lose fat and bone, making the appearance of the chin less prominent over time. The chin and jaw will not be altered in the manner apparent in the image and video with usual dental work. It would have to be a broken jaw bones or broken facial bones. Why have they been saying it's the same person for so long? Here we go, side by side, profile view. This is, these are the photos that the plastic surgeon picked out. Here we go again, two Sister Lucy twos on the bottom, and then the one Sister Lucy on the top. Now, okay, here we go. I bet you never thought about Eye, eyelid creases, or I better put this down. Look what he says. This is quoting from his report to us. It would be very unusual to not be able to detect a crease in the upper lid when an individual is young and then observe such a crease when that same individual ages. However, In images from the 1940s, it is nearly impossible to detect any crease in the upper eyelid. Yet, in the post-1967 photos, the upper lid crease is observable in nearly every photograph. Here we go again. You see up there is the first one. Sister Lucy 2 is on the bottom. This is 1967 over there, and this is 1999 over here. You see? Here we go again. This is, you gotta really look. Oral Surgeon Report by Dr. Joseph Mascaro, DMD. There is no good explanation, except two different individuals. Sister Lucy Truth Commission Dr. Joseph Mascaro, DMD, a well-respected oral surgeon with over 40 years of experience, 
to analyze our full photo and video collections of the two sister Lucys, and provide us with his expert opinion. Dr. Mascaro points out that not only are the profiles of the two individuals in nearly opposite condition, but these differences cannot be explained through dental work, and are caused by different skeletal structures of the face. Because of this medical fact, Dr. Mascaro concludes, it is my opinion that Lucy 1, and Lucy 2, are not, and cannot be the same individual. These opinions are offered to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. From Dr. Mascaro's oral surgeon report. After reviewing the photographic and video evidence over the course of several months, it is clear that Lucy 1, subject AB, and Lucy 2, subject CD, are not the same individual. Several anatomical facts support this conclusion particularly when the profiles are compared. Retrognathic versus prognathic profiles. Lucy 1's mouth, teeth, tend to extend anteriorly, forward. In other words, her mouth area sticks out relative to her other facial structures. This is an underlying feature of Lucy 1's skeletal structure. This skeletal structure would not significantly change if all of her teeth were extracted and dentures worn. In contrast, Lucy 2's profile presents a nearly opposite condition, a prognathic profile with a concave appearance. Lucy 2's presence maxilla, upper jaw, retrusion, and mandibular protrusion. This protrusion is observable as Lucy 2's mandible, chin, is nearly parallel to the tip of her nose, a spot anterior to her nostril. Yet, Lucy 1's chin is recessed relative to the tip of her nose. The most anterior part of Lucy 1's chin is vertically aligned to a spot posterior to her nostril. Tooth extraction and dentures. Skeletal structure would not significantly change if all of her teeth were extracted and dentures worn. Dentures, which seem to be at least reasonably well fit, further support the conclusion that these images depict two different people. The presence of dentures would work to maintain the vertical dimension and prevent over-rotation of the mandible. With the vertical height maintained, there is no good explanation regarding Lucy 2's significant chin protrusion forward when compared to Lucy 1. In addition, Lucy 2's facial height does not appear radically different than Lucy 1 which, again, supports the opinion that removal of all the teeth is unable to account for the marked change in profiles, particularly the mandibular protrusion. A skeletal, not dental, difference. A severely prognathic chin is skeletal, not dental in origin. Conclusion? During the course of my career, I have performed hundreds of jaw, osteotomies, precisely planned fractures of the jaw to reposition the bones, and extracted thousands of teeth. I am familiar with expected changes to an individual's face as a result of tooth extraction and placement of dentures. It is my opinion that Lucy 1 and Lucy 2 are not, and cannot be the same individual. These opinions are offered to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Okay, plastic surgeon's report finding. Finding number three, different eyebrow distances. Some of you noticed this already. The distance between the eyebrow and eye should shorten with age, not lengthen. So this is the 1940s Sister Lucy over there, and this is the 1967 Sister Lucy, 20 years later. In Sister Lucy 2, the distance is longer. Mathematical measuring of the faces establishes ratios that show Sister Lucy 1 has a substantially shorter distance between the bottom of the brow to the upper eyelid, eyelash, when compared to Lucy 2. Okay, and the mathematical measurements that we're giving you has never before been published by us, so you hear it for the first time. So you see, it gets bigger when it's supposed to get smaller. How can this be? Okay, these are the different ratios. Um, 
And when it goes beyond the realm of uh, normal standard deviation, it goes yellow and red. So here's the original, Sister Lucy, and there's the statistics, the numberings for the new Sister Lucy, and you see the standard deviations way above the mean or below. Six point four two. Six point zero four. Four point five. Uh, nine point nine eight. Five point eight four. Uh, five point one six six. Four point five. 7.8, 5.8. This is mathematics. It's not feeling. It's not theology. It's mathematics, which has implications for everything. Okay, he continues. The width of the nose of subject C and D appears wide relative to the mouth when compared to the nose and mouth of subject B. Okay, you see the wide nose of Sister Lucy too. Mathematical measuring of the faces establishes ratios that show Sister Lucy 1 has more a more narrow nose than Sister Lucy 2. When calculating the ratio of the width of the nose relative to the mouth, and the interpulpiary distance. Width of nose is unaffected by aging or maturity. So the width of the nose doesn't change with aging or maturity. So therefore, why the mathematical differences? And here's the statistics. You can see all the red and the orange and the beyond the standard deviation. Okay, photographic anomalies. So you'll love this one. This is what Dr. Garcia pointed out to us, and we started looking into it and doing research. An unexpected insight during Dr. Garcia's analysis concerned a photograph. I'll show you it in a moment. At least one of the images appears to have been tampered with or otherwise altered. Specifically, subject C, exhibit six, presents an image of subject C, that's the 1967 Lucy, that is incompatible with the lighting present in the remainder of the image. This is what he said. This is the most famous picture from the 1967 meeting between Sister Lucy and Paul VI, this picture, and it was published on June 13th, 1967, one month after the event. Look in. Okay. Okay. This is perhaps the most widely published. Okay, good. That's the newspaper that it appeared in. That's the picture. Okay. This is... That was the newspaper, the Vos de Fatima. That was the newspaper produced by the shrine at Fatima. Whoa, what happened to Sister Lucy? She isn't really there. This is the source of them. You see the man with the glasses?
the photographic anomalies multiplied as the examination continued. That's an understatement. Sister Lucy, talking very closely, intimately, friend, in a friendly way with Paul VI. All right, this huge crowd in the background. Notice this flag here, and notice the various characters. Uh, so they're talking, laughing. Guess what? Nope. Where'd she go? That's the source photo. That's the real photo. And then this photo was put out. Oh, what? See the flags? The same position. What is it? The man with his back turned? Same position. And look at he's in exactly the same position. She, she wasn't there. You know how long she spent with him? Three minutes on that day in 1967. Three minutes. Oh, we got another one. Whoa. Perfectly normal, right? Look at the look at the figures. What do you think about Sister Lucy? Remember that face? Remember that picture before? It's the same one. It's the same one that was on that book. It was the same one in the yearbook. Same one near the camera. You think that looks real? I well. Oh boy. Okay. Well, there's she in front of the camera again, and. They manipulate the background a little bit, you see, but she has exactly the same expression on. We still aren't sure regarding how these were made because there was no um, uh, Photoshop in those days. And my friend is looking into this because clearly the, the face of Sister Lucy was tampered with. Okay, the eye positions are strange. Uh, they, they turned the image this way and that to try to make it look plausible. I'm just gonna... Then there's the uh, floating eyebrow. Okay, here we go again. Can you see the floating eyebrow here? Yeah. Yeah. Notice, same picture. Okay, let's get to the same picture. Oh, there she is again. Okay, here we go. There's strange things with the eyes going on. You see there's this bit of flesh right Okay, the oh, forensic artist report. Lois Gibson, she ha she's in the Guinness Book of World Records for, for identifying the most criminals through her sketches. She recreates faces even from skulls, all right? She is the top uh, forensic artist in the world. And she, this is what she said when she did a report. She said, every one of these forensic reports is a complete confirmation of, our, of the thesis. I could have done many more. Any one of the three is conclusive. So I sense this is totally convincing. Okay, Gibson says that the two sister Lucys have completely different facial structures, and therefore it is impossible these are the same woman. And uh, she goes through the uh, comparisons. And I think there's, okay, here, she, based on her pictures from childhood, sister Lucy's, and from the 1940s, that's how she was supposed to look, according to this biometrics and all this. Uh, 60 makes sense. That's how she actually looked. This how she's supposed to look at 80. This how she looks at 84.
Then we have facial recognition reports. The conclusion of it all. This is from Michigan State University, the only university that has a forensic um, a facial recognition lab. Subjects A and B are one individual. That's the child and the um, the 1940s sister Lucy. C and D are very likely also the same individual. B, the real sister Lucy, is different from subject D, the elderly sister Lucy. Okay. And this is he identified another um, facial recognition report. He identified this one identified the um, Boston Marathon bombers, and he says. Uh, facial analysis strongly suggests that subject B, the real sister Lucy, and subject C are photographs from two different individuals, different nose lengths, different philtrum length, different eyebrow shapes, different mouth shapes, and here are all the statistics. This is his facial recognizer. Some people forget faces as soon as they see them. Some people have an extraordinary ability to remember and identify and analyze faces. Well, this woman is ranked the number one super recognizer in Australia. She's part of a whole cutting-edge research at the University of New South Wales, and she was ranked number one in facial recognition. She's a super recognizer. Okay. And what did she say? And she sorted the pictures herself out. She concluded that the first two were the same person, child in 1940s, and the latter two displayed a different person. And then we have the ophthalmologist. Just one more thing here.、Um, So we wanted an ophthalmologist to analyze our material. So he said, "Oh, okay. I have an international conference of 20 of the best ophthalmologists in the entire world coming here to New York. So I'm going to present it to them." So they he presented the Sister Lucy problem to these world class ophthalmologists. You know what strabismus is? Lazy eye, right? Lazy eye. It doesn't fix itself. Well, it ends up where the majority, the supermajority of strabismus experts said the pre-1967 Sister Lucy does have strabismus, lazy eye syndrome. You see, the、uh, her right eye is deviated, her right eye, and then the other one. According to the supermajority of strabismus experts, the post Sister Lucia does not have strabismus, and it doesn't get better with age. Okay, and medical treatments for this condition were not available during the relevant time frames applicable to Sister Lucia. Finally, handwriting evidence. Okay, we presented. Hundreds of pages of handwriting evidence to one of the best handwriting analysts in the world, and guess what he says? Not only the pictures, he didn't even look at the pictures, but get, he said all the letters, all the signatures post 1960 were forgeries, based on. The hundreds and hundreds of pages he had looked at from the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, Sister Lucy. Okay, I want to point out this is the third secret of Fatima. This is something I wasn't expecting to find. He says the secret、uh, released by the Vatican was authentic, probably you know in her handwriting, probably meaning there's more to it. Uh, this is just the vision. There's probably more to it, and that's a mystery that we haven't. We're not going to solve.
Here's the line. Here each is what do they do? They consistently go below the line. They consistently over and over again below, go below the line. The agents. Look at here. Look at the new system, Lucy's writings. Is that below the line? That's above the line. Is that below the line? That's on the line. On the above the line. Above the line. Below. Below. Okay, just the S's. Same S's. Book. Real Sister Lucy. Book. These are different samples. Book. Book. Look at here. No hook. No hook. No hook. No hook. No hook. The letters from 1967, 1969. 1980 were all forgeries. In summary, but it's a clever hoax. It's a clever forgery. In summary, there are some similar strokes to the known writings of Irma Lucia that would be expected if the intent of the writer was to model or copy the writer's style of handwriting. Like all forged documents, the small micro movements and the connections of the pen often reveal details and errors that are not part of the natural writer's execution. In this case, the differences are significant and point to a different writer than the known writer Irma Lucia. There's her signatures. Same. That's the early one, 1940s. That's 1967, 1969. You see the differences? The loops and all that. Okay, let's just, we'll conclude this. The post-1960 writings are definitely by a different hand. These are his conclusions. A significant noticeable discrepancy arises in 1967 and every sample thereafter. Notice the 1969 letter, forgery, demands obedience to Paul VI. Timeline of discrepancy in handwriting matches perfectly with discrepancies in the historical and photographic evidence. What is the best explanation? Another person was posing as Sister Lucy. <laughs> Sherlock, when you have eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Okay, so this is uh, what you can do. <laughs> um, we're not finished. We're going after documents. We're going after some more reports. And we're going to go after the DNA. I'm not supposed to say that, but don't tell anyone. It's not going to be easy. Uh, pray for us if you can contribute to our tax deductible effort. Uh, please do. Let's not let this sit. This is an abomination. Let's get justice for dear sister Lucy, because we owe her that, the true messenger of God and Our Lady. Thank you so much for your attention.